This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, I want to start this morning with just an announcement to remind everybody that the uh, Hearst Logue Wenger uh, meeting is coming up on April 16th. Um, you said you got some uh, info in the via email about that, and that's of course our time to interact with former trainees and uh, current faculty and fellows are encouraged to attend. Uh, we always have, we're still working on the final program. Uh, we usually have a mix of folks, so Steve Clements and Andre Churchwell are working with us to help put together that program and just a mix of uh, current faculty and former trainees uh, come back, some with some remembrances and some a little bit about what's going on now. And uh, it's going to be on a Saturday evening over at the Miller Ward House. So it's usually, it's been really, really a fun thing over the last several years. And I think we finally have the formula down so it doesn't go too long, uh, keep it the right time. And some of our current fellows will be there uh, showing off some of their work with some posters. And uh, we'll give you some more details later on. But put that on your calendars and think about joining us. It, it's really, a, really a good evening. Uh, so today we have uh, Mike McDaniel with us, and as all of you know, Mike uh, uh, was a Medical College of Georgia Medical School and then did internship, residency, fellowship, and joined the faculty in 2009-ish, nine, yeah, okay, it was close, <laughs> and uh, has been a really, uh, really exciting and, and fun member of our faculty, has spent, uh, been involved in many different things, um, he's uh, pretty much driven the entire STEMI program at Grady. And for those of you who haven't heard, uh, Grady's honoring him later this year as the rising star at their big uh, Grady Awards uh, uh, banquet. So we congratulate Michael on that. That was uh, really a great honor and really a tribute to his tremendous efforts in that. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the STEMI program just came online last fall at Grady. And, and Mike has uh, really, as I said, taken a leadership role in that and has uh, some fantastic uh, results. and. Uh, a really impressive uh, program he's put together. But today he's going to talk to us about another thing he's been working on and working on for even longer than that, and that's uh, how to manage pulmonary emboli. And as we all know, that can be a very challenging situation, and he's been working with this PERT, pulmonary embolus response teams, and he's going to tell us all about it. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Good morning. Um, so no disclosures related to this talk, but there will be some off-label discussion of pulmonary embolus. So I thought we'd start with a discussion, uh, start with a case here. This is a 36-year-old with a myasthenia who had uh, also a history of lower uh, extremity amputation who presents to the emergency room with syncope, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Blood pressure is stable. Heart rate is uh, very tachycardic and, t and tachypnic, and she's on a non-rebreather. Troponin is elevated. It uh, has a uh, CT scan done, which shows a uh, very large uh, clot burden in the right main PA and the distal left main PA. And on the CT scan, the RV is very generous compared to the left side. The RV uh, LV ratio is elevated. Echo confirms what you see here with a severely dilated, severely hyperkinetic RV, McConnell sign, no clot in transit, and, and elevations in the right ventricular systolic pressures. And the real question is, is for this patient, what's the best management? Is it anticoagulation alone and you just wait and see how they do and then give uh, lysis uh, if they uh, decompensate? Do you give full-dose full systemic thrombolysis? Do you give half-dose systemic thrombolysis, catheter-directed thrombolysis, surgical embolectomy, angiovac, penumbra, or inari catheter embolectomy, and do you put it in an IVC filter? So we'll come back to this at the end. But to really to start this uh, discussion, you have to be able to risk stratify patients with pulmonary embolus. And I know everybody knows this, but it's important to kind of just review the, the risk stratification. Massive pulmonary embolus, despite the nomenclature, is not how big the clot is, but all about the patient's um, hemodynamics. And massive is defined as patients with sustained hypotension or need for pressors or pulselessness. So it's really about their hemodynamic, and if they're in shock, that defines massive PE. So it's not how massive the clot is, but their hemodynamics. On the, on the other end of the spectrum is the low-risk uh, patients who have uh, normal blood pressures, normal right ventricular function, and uh, no evidence of myocardial necrosis. This is a little bit of more than 50% of the uh, patients with pulmonary embolus, and also not quite as uh, controversial about how to manage uh, 
Probably the most controversial group and where there's probably the most debate is within this moderate uh, group, the submassive, or uh, what the uh, European guidelines term the intermediate uh, pulmonary embolus. This is defined as having normal blood pressure but having some evidence of right ventricular dysfunction or myocardial necrosis. Um, and this is usually screened for by a CT scan because most patients today are going to have a CT uh, PE protocol as the diagnosis for their pulmonary embolus and it's defined or screened for by an RVLV ratio on the CT scan uh, being elevated and then usually confirmed on echo. And the more recent European guidelines have further risk stratified this submassive group into a low and a high risk submassive and I think that's really helpful. This is uh, something Dr. Leeper actually did way before the European guidelines and, and taught us all. Um, it say, and the ones with right ventricular dysfunction uh, and positive troponin, the two together really defined a higher risk group of this submassive. And those uh, with uh, low risk are those with right ventricular dysfunction but negative biomarkers. So the one question to really start with when we start talking about this intermediate group or submassive pulmonary embolus is are patients okay with anticoagulation alone? Most patients get anticoagulation for this therapy for this group of patients and so the question is you know what's the big deal? Is, aren't they okay with anticoagulation? I think what you can say um, is that if you look at the a, a lot of the data um, of patients with stable uh, PE, this is 12 studies looking at uh, right ventricular function, you can see that right ventricular dysfunction either diagnosed by echo or CT is associated with higher in-hospital mortality in total. The same studies also find that uh, another way of looking at right ventricular function the, um, and how the hemodynamics are affected uh, by measuring either BMP or cardiac troponin, again showing significantly worse uh, mortality in hospital when you see these uh, present uh, across a large spectrum of uh, patients with stable PE. And the combination of the two are probably additive and that makes sense. Uh, this is a nice registry of over 1,200 um, patients with stable PE so nobody's in shock and those with normal troponin and normal right, ven uh, uh, right ventricular function have very low in-hospital mortality. But as the right ventricular function becomes impaired and as the troponin becomes elevated, your in-hospital mortality goes up. And at least in this unselected registry of patients, the actual in-hospital mortality for the combination of uh, positive troponin and RV enlargement was 8%, over 8%, which is pretty uh, significant. Um, and just to put in perspective, I mean, higher than ST elevation myocardial infarction today, yet does not probably get the same uh, focus and same uh, degree of uh, attention. And not only is there in-hospital mortality, but these patients probably do worse. There's not as much data about how patients with um, high-risk submassive patients uh, with submassive PE do in follow-up, but there is some evidence that they are not returning to normal function. This is a, a modest-sized series but, series, but if you had elevated pulmonary pressures at diagnosis, that almost half of these patients had some evidence of right ventricular uh, dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension in the follow-up period. And this was a, a significantly uh, higher three-fold increased risk for persistent pulmonary hypertension. And another trial kind of confirmed these sa the same findings, the Moppet trial, which I'm going to show you a little bit more details earlier, a, a little later in the talk. But those patients that only had anticoagulation, there was a 57% of those patients ended up having evidence of right ventricular systolic pressures greater than 40 millimeters of mercury at two years follow-up. Now that's not to say that everybody has symptomatic chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but the point of it is, is that about half the group is not returning to complete uh, normal right ventricular function and right ventricular pressures. And there does seem to be a high incidence of functional limitations after pulmonary embolus. If you take the total group of patients with uh, pulmonary embolus, there's going to be some degree of patients that have, um, you know, reported s symptoms uh, or functional uh, reduced status. Uh, they just don't feel the same as they did before their PE. There's going to be some that have persistent thrombi. They don't totally get rid of all the thrombus and the pulmonary vasculature. For those that you look, there is uh, going to be a certain group that have actually measurable limitations in their cardiopulmonary function, uh, most of this by six-minute walk, um, 
And then a smaller group with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The incidence of this, I think, is debated in the literature, but has been reported to be up to 4% of uh, patients in the whole PE population, and probably higher in those with higher risk of massive PE. So I think while it's important to talk about mortality in this group, the other focus that we really need to make sure we're, we're thinking about is returning patients to their normal functional status and, and their normal quality of life after the pulmonary embolus event. So if it looks like anticoagulation alone is not sufficient because there is higher incidences of uh, probably mortality uh, and, and poor functional status at follow-up, the question is, does full-dose systemic thrombolysis improve outcomes in this population? And this has been the uh, you know, therapy of choice for patients with massive PE. So what about patients with submassive pulmonary embolus? I think what you can say is that systemic thrombolysis is associated with a more predictable decrease in pulmonary pressures. This is a registry of patients with uh, submassive pulmonary embolus, and you can see that those that get heparin, some get better, some get worse, some do the same, whereas a smaller group that gets uh, TPA uh, does have a more predictable decrease in their function. Now, again, these are apples and oranges, but it's at least um, interesting to, uh, to look at. I think this is one of the more interesting studies that's, um, unfortunately, it was stopped early in a very small study, but it does, um, there is data that you can improve uh, patient symptoms with uh, systemic thrombolysis. This was a, uh, the top coat trial, which was supposed to be 200 patients, and they actually had to stop the trial early after only 83 were in, enrolled. But they randomized patients to anticoagulation versus full-dose systemic thrombolysis and looked at, the, a, I think, an important um, composite of not just death and shock and recurrent PE, but also the poor functional status at follow-up, uh, defined as having significantly uh, uh, elevated uh, New York Heart Association classification or impaired six-minute walk. And you can see that those that got anticoagulation had a 37% risk of this composite, and it was reduced with systemic thrombolysis. So your number needed to treat uh, was only about four and a half uh, uh, to uh, achieve this benefit. Now, again, this is, you know, un this is a, a trial that stopped early, and it's a very small group, but it's interesting. You can see that there's significant um, improvements in patients who are New York Heart Class 3 or with impaired six-minute walks, suggesting that anticoagulation is associated with high um, or, or with reduced functional status, and perhaps being aggressive with treatment can improve that. There's also evidence uh, from randomized trials that uh, thrombolysis improves outcomes in patients with high risk of massive PE. This is probably the, the most important trial, the PETHOS trial, over 1,000 patients, high risk of uh, PE, meaning that they had right ventricular dysfunction and elevated biomarkers. Again, randomized anticoagulation to full-dose systemic thrombolysis. And the group that had uh, systemic thrombolysis, again, significantly better uh, outcomes uh, in this uh, was the composite of hemodynamic col collapse within seven days. And these are important uh, things I think we want to reduce, like the need for CPR, hypoten hypotension, need for pressors, uh, or mortality. Uh, so, you know, modest reductions, numbers needed to treat of 29 uh, in this uh, population. And if you take the totality of the uh, randomized trials, and I, I guess it depends on how you look at it, it's uh, about um, 1,700 patients from eight randomized trials, maybe not as uh, much uh, data as we uh, are used to in some of the uh, coronary literature, but um, again, when I show you the massive uh, data, this is actually much greater data than we have even in the massive literature. But if you take the total of all the studies that have been done in the randomized literature, there is probably a mortality benefit by uh, aggressive uh, therapy and systemic thrombolysis. Again, the numbers needed to treat are modest, but probably important. However, there's a huge downside to systemic thrombolysis, as we all know, and that's major bleeding and stroke. And so every trial that's looked at it has had significantly higher major bleeding. This is the PETHOS trial with significantly higher major bleeding complications compared to anticoagulation. And importantly, the, the most important one that we really worry about is the, the stroke and the hemorrhagic stroke, which was, which was significantly increased uh, with uh, um, 
systemic thrombolysis compared to anticoagulation. And again, this is, remember, this is in the randomized data with highly selected patients, and so there's registry data that this is even probably higher, somewhere between three, maybe even as high as 5% in the unselected, um, you know, real-world population outside of clinical trials. So a real limitation, I think, in the uh, full-dose systemic thrombolysis. And so when you go back and look at the same meta-analysis and take all these uh, trials together, together, you know, major bleeding is significantly increased with numbers needed to harm of only about uh, 20 patients. And for intracranial hemorrhage, uh, numbers needed to harm of about 78. So really kind of counterbalancing some of that mortality benefit that you may derive uh, from uh, systemic thrombolysis. So how do you put all this together and what do the guidelines say? Because it's it's very confusing to have these, uh, in, you know, these interactions. Well, the American Heart Association guidelines, which were uh, released uh, a few more a few years ago, they have a um, an algorithm in their guidelines, and they take patients with submassive PE with right heart strain, and if you have the you know significantly uh, elevated biomarkers and right heart strain, defining this high risk submassive uh, PE group, then they do recommend full dose systemic thrombolysis. However, that recommendation is with a 2B level of evidence C. So a pretty weak recommendation. And this was published in 2011 before the data that I just showed you. So the question is, is would this be updated and would this uh, um, hold true today? The other two guidelines, Europeans and CHESS guidelines, come to the opposite conclusion. In, in the European guidelines, um, in 2014, take this submassive group, the intermediate group is the way they call it in their um, guidelines, and if you have positive troponins, meaning that you're intermediate high risk or high risk submassive, they recommend just giving anticoagulation. They think the risks of the therapy outweigh the benefits. And so the real question is, is, is there something better? Because it looks like the American Heart Association with the recommendation of full dose systemic thrombolysis may be too much, but anticoagulation alone, as recommended by CHEST and European, just, you know, is probably not enough. It has higher mortality, higher, uh, worse outcomes. And so are there better ways of treating these patients with more intermediate strategies that better um, balance risk and benefit? And I think there's three interesting options out there today. Um, maybe four in the near future, um, and we wanted to kind of go through those. So for me, the most interesting is, is catheter-directed thrombolysis. And um, for those who may not uh, be familiar with catheter-directed thrombolysis, uh, the way it's performed is usually with we have four to six French uh, multi-sidehold infusion catheters. You can uh, come from the neck or from the leg. You, you place it then into the pulmonary vasculature, into the clot, you bury the, uh, the catheter into the thrombus, and you drip in local TPA through the side holes. But importantly, not only is it local, but the dose is different, and so you give much smaller doses at much slower rates. So the typical dose is about 20 milligrams over 20 hours, or one milligram an hour. And so what this ends up being is about a fifth the total systemic TPA dose at about a tenth the total systemic rate. So that at any given time, the amount of systemic TPA is significantly reduced compared to uh, our systemic TPA. And there is ultrasound facilitated catheters that theoretically may offer an advantage. Um, ultrasound facilitated uh, thrombolysis with the ultrasound in the middle of the catheter what it, uh, at least uh, some of the mechanistic studies suggest that it leads to fibrin separation and allowing the TPA to be kind of pushed into the clot and makes it uh, more uh, accessible to the receptors. Um, these are more theoretical and we don't have uh, definitive data, but there is a reason to think that ultrasound facilitation could help. So I want to show an example because I really think that this kind of highlights some of the benefits as well as some of the weaknesses of what we know when we, when we look at patients uh, for catheter-directed thrombolysis. So this is a patient we saw, a grade 51-year-old, um, no significant past medical history, comes in with acute short of breath, similar to the patient we saw at the beginning, normal blood pressure, very tachycardic, very tachypneic, hypoxic, elevated troponin, elevated BMP. Uh, when you look at the CT scan, significant clot in the uh, distal right and the distal left main PA extending down into the lobar arteries of the uh, left lower, left lower uh, lobe, and 
Importantly, when you look at the CT scan, again, a nice assessment of the RV to LV ratio, showing that the RV is significantly dilated. This is confirmed by the echo, showing uh, significant right ventricular dilation, significant right ventricular dysfunction, McConnell sign, and significant elevations in the right ventricular uh, pressures. This patient uh, was referred for catheter-directed thrombolysis, and uh, before the catheters are placed, measures um, of the uh, main PA pressures here show that there is severe pulmonary hypertension. And, you know, one of the classic th things that we've been taught is that you can't generate severe pulmonary pressures and maintain uh, acutely and maintain a um, uh, normal blood pressure. And, and I think that classic teaching is right most of the time, but not all the time, as may be seen in this case. So. We put in bilateral catheters a, uh, on both sides, on the right and the left, um, put in uh, catheter uh, ultrasound facilitate on the left, give low doses of TPA so that they add up to about a milligram an hour uh, for, per catheter for 20 hours. Then the next day, the patient returns to the lab and uh, the uh, clot is much improved. I don't have the uh, movies here to show you this, but this is the clot on the left side. And you can see that it is significantly improved, but it's not completely uh, dissolved. And the mean PA pressures then have reduced to 32 millimeters of mercury. So you've taken someone from severe pulmonary hypertension down to mild pulmonary hypertension with a 20-hour infusion. And I, I, I like this example because I think it shows um, another important um, point in this is that you don't have to remove all the clot to, to get some of the hemodynamic benefit in terms of reductions of uh, pressures. But the other thing I like about this is it, it highlights the dilemma we have when we take care of these patients is what is, when is good, good enough? So when do you stop your therapy? Because the nice thing about catheter-directed thrombolysis is you can tailor the therapy to the patient. The only problem with that is what do you tailor it to? Do you tailor it to their pulmonary pressures, to the clot burden on the CT scan, to their RV function um, on echo or on... CT or other things, and so, or is it just on their clinical findings? And so I show this to say that I don't, we don't have the answer to this, but that it's an interesting uh, therapy because you can tailor it to those things. So given the fact that there was still a fair bit of clot burden and the uh, pulmonary pressures had not normalized, we ended up switching the uh, catheter to a different branch and, and then continued a unilateral effusion for another 20 hours, um, concentrating just on the left side. And after another 20-hour infusion, the uh, uh, mean PA pressures had normalized. And so it took somebody from, from severe pulmonary hypertension, but was not in shock, to basically in normal pressures. Now, I say this not to say that this is the way you need to treat every patient, but to show that it, it is a way to tailor therapy, but we need to learn to figure out what the best uh, surrogates are to tailor it to. What we can say is that the literature suggests that there are improvements in early, um, early, uh, uh, quick early improvements with catheter-directed thrombolysis. This is, uh, these are three trials, um, the PERFECT registry and the Seattle registry with about 250 patients total in those, and the ultimate trial, uh, randomized trial, I'll show you the data in just a second. And what you can see is significant reductions in pulmonary pressures acutely within 24 hours with very low bleeding complications and no rates of intracranial hemorrhage, at least in these trials. This is the data from Emory, Emory Midtown uh, uh, that Wassam uh, has put together. It's unpublished, but in their experience so far, um, about 60 patients, a uh, majority of them submassive, most of them treated with bilateral catheters and about half with ultrasound facilitation, again, showing similar findings uh, to these registries, significant early reductions in, in uh, PA pressures within 24 hours uh, with, you know, average doses or median doses of 24 millimeters, I mean, 20, uh, it's supposed to be 24 milligrams of TPA. One of the interesting things, though, is, is, is the ultrasound even necessary? And there's so many things to learn in this field that we don't know. What's interesting in the PERFECT registry is that those that had ultrasound facilitation uh, or the ultrasound catheters actually didn't do any better than those that just had standard infusion catheters. And if you looked at the average pressure change 
from baseline to follow-up was very similar whether you had the ultrasound or the just non-ultrasound catheters. And there's actually one randomized small trial in the DVT literature that showed the same thing. So it does question whether the ultrasound is necessary, which is important in today's um, healthcare environment because the ultrasound catheters you pay a huge premium for, and so it's important to understand where that uh, comes from and what the benefit is. I want to show you the ultimate trial because it's important because it's the only randomized trial in the whole uh, PE literature of catheter therapy. So it depends on how I guess you look at it. On one take, it's only 59 patients using a surrogate outcome, but on the other, other hand, it's the only data. So you have to give them credit for at least getting this done. Uh, this is 59 patients, high-risk submassive PE, randomized to ultrasound-facilitated catheter-directed thrombolysis or, and, versus just anticoagulation. And the primary endpoint is kind of a, a confusing one. They just looked at the improvement in the right ventricular function. So how did the right ventricle goal get better? And when you give patients anticoagulation the next day, there's no improvement. Anticoagulation doesn't work quickly. It takes, it, it takes, in fact, it really doesn't work at all. It just it prevents the clot from worsening as your intrinsic thrombolytic system kicks in. So not surprisingly, if you give somebody anticoagulation and you look at them the next day, they're the exact same. Whereas if you use ultrasound uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis, you get very rapid reductions in the RV size. Now this is because probably you're lysing the clot and you are reducing the PA pressures, which is then improving the right ventricular function. Now what's interesting is over time, within three months, you will get a catch-up with anticoagulation uh, because your intrinsic thrombolytic system will lyse a lot of this clot and you will get improvements in the right ventricular function and, and PA pressures. But at least in this trial, there was, it was about a 50% you know, reduction in uh, RV-LV ratio improvements with catheter-directed thrombolysis. Now, this is a surrogate outcome. We don't know, does this 50% improvement mean that you'll be 50% better? There's gonna be, is there going to be 50% better mortality, 50% better symptom status, 50% less chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and shortness of breath at follow-up? We don't know. This is just a surrogate, but it's intriguing at least, and I think deserves a lot more um, attention. The other thing we have is a lot of registry data. Again, this is um, kind of dirty data. It's uh, just a, a nationwide inpatient sample. Look at this. Over 1,000, uh, 1,500 patients. Um, and they tried to permit propensity match, but this is, um, you know, not the best uh, registry data. So what, you, what they find is catheter-directed thrombolysis compared to those who get systemic thrombolysis and pulmonary embolism is associated with lower mortality. This is apples, though, and this is oranges, so you, 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 it's hard to say much because I'm sure the sicker people get systemic thrombolysis and less sick patients get catheter-directed thrombolysis. So it's hard to make too much of this, but I think, again, this is hypothesis generating that maybe we need to continue to look at this as maybe catheter-directed thrombolysis can give you efficacy as well as improve safety, and we need more data. So what do the guidelines say about uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis? Well, the 2014 guidelines say it's an area of uncertainty, and we need more information. The updated CHESS guidelines just released um, I think are a little confusing and um, when I have discussions sometimes with, uh, when we have discussions about patients, people often quote the CHESS guidelines and I think it's important to read. It says, in patients with acute PE who are treated with thrombolytic agent, we suggest systemic thrombolytic therapy over, using a peripheral vein over catheter-directed thrombolysis or the catheter-directed therapy. And I, I want to show you why they, they cite this. Um, they cite a study to, for that recommendation from 1988 where there was 34 patients in the trial. And what they did is they gave everybody full dose IV or they put in, they didn't really say what they did. I, I imagine what they did is they probably put in like an eight French pigtail into the main PA and blasted in, you know, full dose TPA through a, a pigtail catheter. And what they found was that, and you did it that strategy, giving bolus doses of large uh, TPA, that there's no clinical benefit to the catheter. And so they recommended against it. But, in, in, and so I would, re, I would agree with this trial that if you think full dose, 100 milligrams of TPA given over two hours, which is the standard uh, TPA dose in massive PE, that y you're right. If you're going to give that, you probably don't need to put it in a catheter. But this isn't the way contemporary practice is done with catheter-directed thrombolysis in that you, you know, you, now today you would use small infusion catheters, 
And importantly, the low dose, slow infusions, and maybe it's even the, the rate that's the most important uh, part of this. So again, I, I just I show this that I don't think this study is relevant to the contemporary practice of, uh, t of um, catheter-directed thrombolysis. And, and the chest guidelines, in my opinion, are a little bit misleading uh, by um, using that as a citation. So a second option, I think, that's more intermediate um, is half-dose systemic thrombolysis. So when we look at this systemic thrombolytics, um, I, I think it really questions, do we even know what the right dose is for patients, for any patients with PE? And in at least this, this study questions whether we know what the right dose is. And um, this was a modest-sized trial, 118 patients with massive and submassive PE, and they randomized them to full or half-dose TPA. And then they looked at a surrogate outcome of how they did uh, with, on their CT scan, and they looked at the RV-LV ratio, and they could see that full and half-dose had similar reductions in the RV-LV ratio, similar reductions in PA pressure, similar improvements in lung perfusion defects, similar uh, reductions or improvements in obstruction score. So you, you seem to get about the same efficacy with a half of a dose as you would with full dose, and there was less bleeding complications. And there is some data um, on a half-dose strategy. This is a, is a, you know, a moderate-sized trial, Moppet trials, um, the, the one randomized trial to look at a half-dose strategy. It's 121 patients, so about twice as, as much as Ultima looking at catheter-directed, so uh, uh, about twice the size. Again, a similar population, high-risk submassive PE. And they were randomized to anticoagulation, I'm sorry, anticoagulation or, or, or half-dose TPA. And you can see that the half-dose TPA had significant reductions in pulmonary pressures compared to uh, anticoagulation alone. So their primary endpoint was just having a right ventricular systolic pressure greater than 40 at uh, follow-up um, by echo. And you can see significant reductions with very small numbers needed to treat to get this improvement. Again, this doesn't mean that all these patients are going to have chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but it just means that there are uh, abnormalities seen on the echo in a significant number of patients who receive anticoagulation alone. And then there's small uh, registries that kind of confirm these findings. This is uh, a registry of about 78 patients. They get half-dose systemic thrombolysis for intermediate PE, and it does show significant reductions in um, pulmonary pressures. Again, this is similar to the catheter-directed thrombolytic literature, which you have elevated PA pressures. You give the uh, medication, and you get early reductions that are then sustained at follow-up. And importantly, again, in this uh, registry, there was no major bleeding complications. Now, these are highly selected uh, patients in the registries, and um, I think in larger numbers, we're not going to see no bleeding complications, but I do think that the data is suggesting it's less than full-dose systemic TPA. Well, what, does the, what do the guidelines say about the half-dose strategy? Well, the American Heart and the Chest Guidelines, it's not, it's not in the guidelines. Um, it's not mentioned. And the 2014 European Guidelines... Uh, again, put it as an area of uncertainty and a, a need for more study. So, just like the chest, I mean, just like for catheter directed thrombolysis, the use of the half dose strategy, not a guideline supported strategy, but something that's very intriguing. Um, the third option, uh, I think, that's worth uh, talking about, and it's hard to say it's an intermediate option, but as, is embolectomy. But I think it's intermediate in that the risks of bleeding tend to be probably intermediate between uh, anticoagulation and full-dose systemic thrombolysis. So another example, um, this is a, a patient, a grady 42-year-old, post-op day 5 from a craniotomy and tumor resection, still has in a lumbar drain. Unfortunately, then has syncope, transient hypotension, and hypoxia. A CT scan is performed, and you can see there's a saddle uh, pulmonary embolus with really extensive clot burden in the uh, distal right main PA. It goes bilaterally. The RVLV ratio is significantly elevated or dilated. Uh, echo confirms uh, what we see here, severe right ventricular dis uh, dilation, right ventricular dysfunction, and significantly elevated right ventricular systolic pressures troponins elevated and define somebody as a high-risk submassive pulmonary embolus. Importantly, with the recent surgery uh, on the uh, CNS system, probably has an absolute contraindication to any uh, TPA. So this patient was referred 
for surgical embolectomy. And I wanted just to show you uh, just briefly if this plays well. So here is uh, Dr. Keeling um, and uh, extracting uh, from the main PA uh, this thrombus. It comes out actually in block. And um, the reason I wanted to show that is to show how impressive this thrombus is. And because uh, we don't get to see this, this is, a, this is not all cases look like that. But there's a lot of patients with submassive PE that have that much clot. And it's just, if you, if you think about the European and chest guidelines, they recommend, uh, they recommend um, uh, uh, anticoagulation for uh, patients like that. So I think it's an impressive uh, to see uh, that, that what, 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 uh, what it uh, can look like um, you know, when it comes out in block. Well, I think surgery is an important thing to, to think about for these patients, too. Uh, not for all patients, but for a selected group of patients. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the surgical experience in the Emory system is outstanding. It's really been led by Dr. Latouf, and most of this data has, has been his, his work over the years, and most recently, Dr. Keeling has uh, also um, uh, um, uh, joined him in, in trying to really make uh, surgical pulmonary embolectomy a, a good treatment for a lot of these patients. And I think it's important to put it in the context of the way uh, surgery was done in the past, it, it used to be that you waited till you had somebody on two, three, four pressers, and then you called your surgeon and say, I've got no other options, let's go operate. They would take the patient uh, as a bailout um, uh, with no other options, and they would have, you know, very high mortality rate. And so in some of the uh, literature out there, the surgical experience for pulmonary embolism is, is, has, has an extremely high mortality. But, but with Careful patient selection and, and, most importantly, early identification and early surgery before the shock uh, really gets um, um, to be a significant issue, taking these patients for surgical em embolectomy can be a great option for these patients with really uh, low morbidity and low mortality. Again, if you look at the, th the Emory experience, most of this with Dr. Latouf, 30-day mortality, very low, no strokes, and very uh, low re-exploration. And for those that do have uh, follow-up data for um, echo, you can have significant uh, improvements in right ventricular functions and PA pressures in this uh, high-risk group. So it's not for everybody. This isn't what we want to do for everybody, but it's a really good therapy for, for some patients and probably should be thought about in a lot of our patients with high-risk submassive PE and perhaps some with the massive PE. What about catheter embolectomy? Because being an interventional cardiologist, I, you know, I think we all think that that, or at least I think that that's the way we want to move this uh, field uh, to be able to remove uh, the clot uh, just like we saw as done by surgery. And I think there's four interesting catheters out there. I think all of them have a, a long way to go compared to what was done surgically. Um, but the penumbra catheter, 14 French aspiration catheters, these are basically a 14 French version of what we use in the coronary circulation, flow retriever, and angiovac. And I, I want to just make a few mentions about a couple of these um, specifically. So one is the flow retriever catheter. It's an interesting technology, and I, I, I want uh, to mention it because we're probably going to start a study with it soon. It basically looks like sort of three amplatzer discs, and you, you deploy it in the pulmonary artery into the clot. And similar to the stent retriever systems in the acute stroke where you embed the stent into the clot and then retrieve the stent back in to kind of remove the clot, similar thought at least uh, with this technology. So you embed it, 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 it uh, embeds into this, and then you pull it out together and you aspirate it. And as you pull back on the lever, uh, you aspirate it as you pull the uh, um, device back into the, to the catheter and it will bring out some of the clot in theory. So we've had, a, we've had a couple cases with it, have not had, um, uh, uh, oops, I didn't disconnect, did I? Right there, all right. Sorry about that. So this is an, a, a, a case from another institution. Um, a uh, patient with a history of DVT, PE, has syncope, hypoxia, tachycardia, uh, blood pressure is um, stable, uh, CT scan shows uh, bilateral PEs, or elevated RV, LV ratio, goes for angiography. You can see there's clot in both PEs, I mean, the both uh, distal PAs uh, here on the right and the left. The flow retriever catheter is done, and you uh, remove uh, a modest amount of clot there. 
and uh, with significant improvements in the perfusion uh, to both the uh, lobes on the both sides, and Im importantly, with uh, significant improvements in the RV function after the uh, after the embolectomy procedure from baseline uh, to follow up. So. This is a therapy that doesn't have a lot of data for, but we're, I wanted to mention it because the, they are going to start a study, the FLARE study, hopefully uh, in the near future. It's just been, uh, has SDA approval to move forward using the flotriever pulmonary embolectomy catheter. So I think it's an important uh, uh, catheter to mention, and we need more uh, data about how this is going to be utilized, but at least uh, moving forward with a study to understand its risks, its benefits, and uh, how it can be used. Um, I think the other thing to, to ma make mention is the AngioVac. Um, it ha we haven't used it yet in the PE arena, but it has been used nationally for that. It's a large catheter. It has a, uh, basically a suction uh, on the end of it, and it's basically sort of a, a vacuum hose. You suck it out. You then filter it and you trap the thrombus, and then you have a return uh, circulation uh, through a second access site. It's a large bore catheter. It has been used um, in several cases uh, on, on multiple campuses for right atrial clots. This is an example of a right atrial clot that we did a few years ago off of a, uh, a, off of a, a line. But I wanted to show you this because it's a large catheter, and it's not the most, uh, it's not the easiest to track through uh, the tricuspid valve out, out the uh, RVOT into the, into the PA. So I think it's, it has a ways to go before it's a routine catheter for um, PE, but it's an interesting one in that it uh, uh, does work very well when utilized. More, more recently, um, Penumbra has come uh, uh, available, and Penumbra does have some data out there in the stroke literature. It's actually one of the catheters, the five and six French versions, have been used a lot in the stroke literature, and, and um, some of the interventional neurologists in our system have, have used it a lot. Um, it's basically just a suction catheter that hooks up to a vacuum, and you just aspirate with sort of this... Uh, 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 um, this, uh, I guess, a little marble thing on the end that you use it to keep the aspiration going, and you engage the clot with it, and then you pull it back in. Um, it has good data for the uh, circul uh, for in the neuro systems, and recently an eight French version has been used. We've uh, used it once in the in the in a pulmonary embolus, and um, you know it had modest uh, benefits. But I think we need a lot more information. Uh, there's no data out there. There's no series. There's no even case reports out there for its use in the pulmonary vasculature, but there's a lot of interest in it. I think the interest is that it's low profile and very easy to use. So from, from our standpoint, it's a very easy catheter. I think when you look at its downside, here's an eight, this is the eight French version. It's really small when we think about what we just uh, saw with the surgery. And so that, the question will be, um, you know, is it gonna be a, a benefit at, at, at that size? So we need more information. Well, what is embolectomy in the guidelines? Um, I like the American Heart Guidelines because they put everything as 2B level of evidence C. So you don't have to think too hard. It's just consider it. We have no data, and that's our expert opinion. So I think that's true. I mean, there's just no data and something to consider. So to, f to, f to, final, to finish here quickly, I want to just say two things. One is what's the role for IVC filters? Uh, simply, the guidelines are, are, are pretty negative on them. Uh, they're class three for the chest and European guidelines not to use them routinely. There's only one randomized trial. It is worth mentioning because it's important that it's 400 patients. It was randomized. They took patients, they gave them a filter um, uh, or not. Uh, most of them were submassive and all patients had a DVT. And when they looked at recurrent PE, if you got a filter, it did not reduce the incidence of recurrent PE and it didn't help any of the, out, the uh, other, other secondary outcomes either. So this is the only data um, for randomized literature. It doesn't suggest that it helps that much. Uh, again, it took a long time to get this trial completed, and the trouble is there's a lot of data that looks like this. And if you look at the registry data uh, of large numbers of patients, if those that get filters and submassive and massive PE, whether you get lytics or not, they do better, they have lower mortality. So the question is, are we putting filters in the patients who do well? And it's the patients that are driving this benefit, possibly or probably, um, but is the filter helping these patients who are low risk to get to these outcomes? Maybe, we just don't know. So I show it as an area of controversy and we, we need some more information, but the randomized data at least is negative. What about massive pulmonary embolism? One point to make, um, 
I think there's only a couple things to, to say. I think we all know systemic thrombolysis is the treatment of choice today in, in, in massive PE, but I want to say that that's based on not one, there's no randomized trial that's looked at that. It's just a composite of, or a, um, uh, multiple uh, patients from randomized trials, but, it's, but the total literature is very small, 254 patients um, to make up these meta-analyses. And there are benefits, but there's also significant complications and major bleeding. So I show this just, just to say that there's a lot of, uh, that we don't have a lot of randomized data in massive PE. What we do have is a lot of data that looks like this. Again, registry data that those that have massive PE, they have lower mortality if they get lytics, but they have higher mortality if they don't. But the important thing is, is that only a minority are actually treated with this therapy. So even if it's, the, if it's a great therapy, there needs to be other options because a lot of patients aren't being treated with it. The other thing is, is that mortality has been pretty flat. We're not making any progress in this very important um, uh, disease state. And if you look at it, it's been flat over this decade. I'm sure if you came out to 2016, it'd be flat too because there's been no progress and there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing coming to suggest that we would make an impact without changes. And so I really do think that this is a call that we need to move just like PE, I'm just like MI and stroke from a supportive to a thrombolytic to possibly a combination of embolectomy and maybe catheter-directed thrombolysis for a lot of patients with massive PE. But we need data and we need uh, registry. So back to this example that we started, remember we started with a high-risk submassive PE to start this case and we asked what's the best management? You know, do you give anticoagulation alone, as recommended by our chest and European guidelines? Or do you give full-dose systemic thrombolysis, as recommended by the American Heart Guidelines? Or do you give half-dose systemic thrombolysis, which is not recommended in the guidelines? Do you do catheter-directed thrombolytics, which is not recommended in the guidelines? Surgical embolectomy, not, in, not indicated. Angiovac, penumbra, and RE embolectomy, which we have no data for, and no even registry data. And do you put a filter in, which is recommended against? So the, the, the really final, this, this, you know, the best treatment's unknown, guidelines are inconsistent, the standard approach and therapy is all over the map, it probably varies by whatever hospital you're in, the physician on that night, and there's traditionally been no single team, no accepted algorithms, no systematic evaluation of results. And so this has led to the idea that we need to change the way it's taken care of with pulmonary embolism response teams, and we've tried to do this in the Emory gradient system. The idea behind this stems from what's done at uh, Mass General and, and other places um, where there are multidisciplinary teams. The goal is to standardize but yet individualize care and, and have smaller groups of physicians caring for these patients. Be able to provide 24-7 immediate multidisciplinary consultation for the highest risk patients to coordinate the care which needs to be done through lots of different specialties, develop and refine our protocols, uh, standardize the follow-up and, and uh, dedicated clinics, and we need then the quality improvement and the research to then really, you know, uh, tell how we're doing. And so the idea of a PE team or a PERT is that, you know, a PE is identified either in an ED or another hospital or by a hospitalist, and they call a one-call pager to a team leader. And then that PE team leader risk stratifies the patient and then gets the other folks involved. This can be done sometimes virtually. Some uh, institutions like MGH actually do uh, go to meeting.com to do this facilitation and have it online. Um, we've done it often uh, just in person and with phone calls. Uh, we have explored that technology. It's, it's okay to use, but anyway, it's, the idea is, is that you bring a lot of people to the table and you have shared decision making and you try to prevent, you pr present what you think is a consensus one best view for either surgery or catheter therapies or medical therapies. And this idea is catching on and, and um, a group of us, uh, Wassam Jabber, uh, Henry Lieberman, Omar Latouf, and uh, Brent Keeling and I went up to uh, the first uh, uh, National PERT Consortium, and this is uh, led out of MGH, and the idea is to get a, a group of centers, and the first meeting was about 40 centers in the United States, to uh, try to address this and come up with better ways of doing this and share experiences and then to develop a network or collaborative group of academic centers that, that can then uh, develop registries, develop uh, uh, a consortium of, of, of groups that can uh, do the studies that need to be done uh, to try to address this. So uh, we're going back up for the second uh, meeting in, in June and in, in the meantime have been working on different um, parts of the, the uh, consortium.
we have tried to you know put down on paper what we think is the right way to go I'm gonna hold this and not go through this and I can show you this at the end but to try to develop you know protocols for how to take care of this with the with the caveat that it has to be individualized to any any one patient and I'll show this at the end if uh, we can if we want to talk through and work through an algorithm like that and then what are the next steps well I think we need PERT teams ideally at all the hospitals and we really need to establish this more than just the high-risk group and have outpatient clinic with more standardized follow-up so that we're really getting more standard with the type and duration of treatment which I don't know if you've like many hospitals, the anticoagulation and these patients kind of get put on autopilot with nobody thinking on regular um, uh, regular intervals of whether you need to be on it or if so, what type of uh, therapy. Screening for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and getting filters out. I didn't show the data, but since the Emory Midtown team has been in place, the filter removal, and this has largely been uh, uh, work of Wassam, has, has dr and dramatically increased. In every hospital, even very good hospitals, have very poor filter removal rates, and this has really uh, increased with the use of a PERT team. We need to get to same-day discharge for the low-risk PE. A lot of low-risk patients probably don't even need to be in the hospital. They need to be following up in the outpatient clinics. We need participation with registries and randomized trials through National PERT Consortium, and uh, uh, we're trying to organize, uh, um, Sam has been trying to organize a Atlanta consortium, so maybe we can develop some things on a more local uh, basis. I think that we also, uh, many of us really think that catheter therapies could be uh, a, a big part of what we do, but they're all okay, and we need to work perhaps with some of our engineers and get partnerships to, to take these uh, uh, ideas and perhaps either partner with the device companies or develop some on their own because there's clearly going to be better ways to do this, and we need to continue to push that. So the final, this was that last that case that we started with. What did we do? Well, um, the, this was a Midtown case. They called the uh, Midtown uh, PE team. I was on call. Uh, received the call. We discussed it. Uh, the case, remember, uh, pretty extensive clot burden uh, with our surgeon. We really considered surgical embolectomy, but the left, the left PA was not quite as great, and it seemed like maybe was not necessary to do a, a, a sternotomy for this degree. We were really worried because the patient was going to uh, decompensate, so thought catheter therapy may take a little bit of time, so we ended up pushing half-dose systemic TPA. And I show this case not to illustrate this is what you do, but to illustrate how you can individualize cares. The patient did better clinically, but got a repeat imaging 12 hours after the TPA, and you can see that the, the clot is better, but it's not fully resolved. And the RV function, or the RV size, is still pretty dilated despite a half dose of TPA. And the echo confirmed this, and the right ventricular function was, was still enlarged. So we took the patient to the cath lab, and, and despite having had a half dose of TPA, there was still moderate pulmonary hypertension and reduced cardiac output, so we put in a unilateral catheter for catheter-directed thrombolytics, did another 20 milligrams of TPA, and the patient normalized the PA pressures back to normal um, and essentially normal echo and was discharged. So I showed this case not to say this is how you take care of these patients, but to show the, um, the, the, the fact that the it's a multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. You can consider a lot of therapies. And most of these are not guideline recommended therapies, but more intermediate strategies, and then try to tailor to the individual patient. So with that, thank you. Thanks, Mike. That's fantastic. Um, I'll start out with one question. So, so for that intermediate group, do we ever give full-dose thrombolytics for them now, or, or are we past that? I, so I'll, I'll give my opinion. I think we're past it. Uh, I think that the, the data is uh, um, the, the bleeding risk is, is probably too high. And it's, I don't even know that we know what the right dose of systemic TPA is. And, it's, and even for maybe patients with massive PE, we don't know. Maybe we need to be giving half-dose TPA to our massive group. I say that that's a maybe without any guidelines or studies to do that. But I think it's a treat intriguing. And so um, we have not given a full dose to my knowledge, any recently to a submassive. Work. Okay. So, Mike, uh, the bleeding rates with thrombolysis are much higher than what we saw in the infarct myocardial infarction population with the early 
GPATNK um, studies. Is there something going on with the inflammatory response, or what is it that causes all that intracranial hemorrhage? It's a great question, and I, you know, I don't know if it's uh, the population. There's more cancer. Uh, there's more comorbidities. Um, you know, I, I don't know that, but it's we. It, it's it's definitely your point is well taken that there's very good data that the t, the intracranial hemorrhage rate from the MI literature is much lower, and uh, consistently in the PE population is much higher. So, it's a good question. I don't I don't have the answer for it. So Mike, um, great talk and kudos to you and Wassam for leading this effort um, as truly multidisciplinary. My question to you is, and you may have covered this, I missed the beginning of your talk, but uh, do we have any Emory protocols that are in the works, any uh, uh, clinical protocols that you may want to address, and also some, um, some grants that I know are, are in the works to try to um, take leadership nationally in answering some of this question. It does seem like a huge opportunity for us to get leadership and I'm, help define some of this. I completely agree. I'll show this. I don't want to go through it, but I'll just leave it up here. This is an algorithm that we've developed here, and I'll say this has gone through multiple um, versions. And so this is our best thoughts today on paper. And the one thing I would say about this is we've, we've, we've learned what works and what learned, learned not what, what doesn't work. One thing that doesn't work is taking a protocol and passing it out and giving it to a lot of people who don't know the disease process really well. Because what we found is that we, at, uh, at early in our experience at Grady, we had a lot of residents and fellows running around with the, with, with the protocols in hand. And, and, it, and what we realized is that we weren't always following the protocol that we developed. And so it did then kind of create um, some, I think, um, angst amongst people taking care of uh, patients. And so I think that this is a good tool, but it, sh it should be individualized to any, any patient. Um, secondly, I guess back to grants, uh, there, there is, we, we will be participating in a national registry through the PERT consortium, so that will hopefully start to develop national data. We hope to bring it to a multi-hospital. Uh, it's going to start at Midtown. Um, we're looking for funding. A lot of this comes down to funding, so we hope to have some funding for Grady uh, through some internal sources. And then we've looked to uh, some of the catheter companies to fund some studies looking at the need for ultrasound versus non-ultrasound catheter. Um, you know, is there really a benefit or, is, or is, is the ultrasound not necessary? And then some sort of combination of the embolectomy and thrombolysis. I'd love to take us into the massive arena, which is really where the, the, I think a lot of benefit could be. I think we need to do things different there. But the problem is, is the number of patients that we'll see on an individual year, even in our multi-hospital system, is still low. And so we're going to need partners to, 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 to do that. So we hope through the PERT consortium, through the, e, the Southeastern Consortium, through EPIC and, and others uh, to, to, to find some partners. Michael, one suggestion, one question. Suggestion on the follow-up. I would look at response to pulmonary artery pressures to mild exercise. I think that will help you further define the efficacy of what you've done, because you can be sort of normal at rest and the delta would, it will soar up. The, the question is, how much organization of thrombi is being seen in the, thrombic, in the thrombectomies? Uh, have you looked at that? It's a good question, and um, you know I think that you know most of the patients are are um, are, are, are be, it's with uh, the thrombectomies are done fairly acutely, and so it's there are organized thrombi, but it's it tends to be a little bit more acute clot. There are some of the patients though that have gone for embolectomy that are more chronic, and they become much more organized. And the outcomes, in the the ease of surgery, and, and the outcomes are not quite as good in that group. And sometimes it can be hard to tell by just looking at the CT scan and and talking to the patient in the, the clinical presentation. So it is a little bit difficult. But the more organized, the, the probably the worse. All of those therapies are going to be both surgery, embolectomy, as well as uh, TPA. And I, I, I like the I like your point about the exercise, and that's why I think we need to take these one more. We need we need outcome data on how patients are doing at follow up, and we need to understand their functional limitations. And, and exercise is part of that because a lot of people may normalize their RV, maybe even normalize their right ventricular pressures, but they're not back to normal, and they can't do what they used to do. 
I'd like to want to thank you for the talk. I also want to uh, just say that you know Mike's reach goes far beyond Emory. I'll tell you, I had a family member a year ago who had a sort of some massive, massive PE postoperatively and was being trying to be. I guess they were going to treat her conservatively with heparin and talk to Mike and with his uh, advice, we were able to push her to uh, a facility which gave her uh, um, directed thrombolytics and you know she went. A year later, normal RV function, normal functional status, jogging well with no problems, <laughs> and uh, and so you know that kind of expertise really has a huge impact, and you know particularly in places where where it's not an everyday occurrence. So, thanks very much for your great talk, and thanks for your care. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.